Welcome back to Walking Through the Word. Today we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter 1, verse 21 through 30. So grab your Bibles and follow along with me. In these passages of Scripture that we're going to read, we are going to actually examine Paul's words to the church in Philippi about what it means to have eternal hope in the life and death of a Christian. What does it mean to live to the glory of Christ and to die for the glory of Christ? Why should Christians even think about death as a glorious thing? So as we continue our study, keep in mind these questions. Verse 21, Paul says, For me, and yes, that's Paul the Apostle. He says, For me, to live is Christ. That should be every Christian sentiment, that every aspect of our life, what we do, what we say, how we live, is to be to the glory of Christ. We are to keep in mind and in our hearts Christ and put Christ as supreme above all else. He is preeminent, and so therefore he should be the one receiving every aspect of our life for his glory. And this was Paul's sentiment. That's my sentiment. I want to live for Christ. My life is dedicated to the things of Christ. So for Paul to live is Christ. And you, Christian, as you read these passages of Scripture, you should be telling yourself, for me to live is Christ. Christ above me, Christ below me. Christ in me, Christ in front of me, Christ behind me, Christ is all in all. But then Paul says something incredible, and he says, And to die is gain. Now Christians, I know we have a hard time thinking about and experiencing and living through the pain of death. But for Paul, death was a gain. It was an addition. It was above living. It was greater than living for Christ, which is a very strange thing to say. We don't usually think of death as something to be gained, as something positive. And yes, Paul is talking about death in a positive manner. We don't normally talk about death as a positive thing. For, even for Christians, it's such a hard thing to talk about. We don't normally think about death as being something to be gained. And yet for Paul, he's saying death to die is gain. And then he's going to explain why. Why is death greater than living for Christ? He says in verse 22, Now if I, that's Paul, if I live on in the flesh, that's what he means that for him, for me is to live, to live as Christ, living on in the flesh. He says, this means fruitful work for me. So in this first component of the verse, he's saying that life in and of itself is for the glory of Christ. And now if he lives on in the flesh, then that means he's going to continue to live for Christ. He's going to continue Gaining greater and greater fruitful work. And this work for him is the work of the gospel. The work of the kingdom. This is the harvesting of souls. The missionary work that Paul was engaged in throughout the Roman Empire. So this fruitful work is what he means when he says to live is Christ. That every aspect of his life is dedicated to the work of of the gospel and of the kingdom of God. 
So this is the second aspect. And to die is gain. And he says in these two realities, in the last part of this verse, he says, and I do not know which one I should choose. What does he mean when he says which one I should choose? He's actually talking about to live or to die. He's saying, I have these two realities in front of me. Remember, this is a, a prison epistle. He's writing this letter from pr prison to the church in Philippi. And he's saying to them, I have these two choices before me, either to live or and if I live, that's for Christ. And if I live on in the flesh, then that means I'm going to keep producing fruitful work for Christ. But I also have this other option, which is to die. And to die is gain. It's a positive thing. In fact, I think in Paul's mind, it was better than living for Christ. And he was torn between these two. He says, I don't know which one I should choose. I don't know if I should continue to live for the fruitful work of the gospel or if I should die because it's gain. And he explains this more in verse 23. He says, for I am torn. I mean, he was in turmoil. He really was contemplating. Should I just continue to live for Christ or should I just go home to be with the Lord? He said, I'm torn between the two. What was those two? life and death again as christians we don't normally think of death as being a glorious gain we usually think of living for christ as the greater thing but for paul death was the greater aspect because this is what this is what he says about death specifically in verse 23 I long to depart and be with Christ. That's why death is gain. That's why for Paul, he was torn between the two. Because on one hand, he could continue living and continue working and continue producing more fruit and harvesting more souls, which is good for other people, which would be good for the church, which would be good for the Philippians. But to die for him was gain because that was a benefit for him. He longed, he desired, he was hoping to depart, to die and be with Christ. How much better is it to be in the arms of the Savior in eternal hope? He says, which is far better Death for him was far better because he got to be with Christ. This is how Christians should think about death. Now, of course, when we lose a loved one, when we lose our mom, when we lose our dad, when we lose our brother and sister, when we lose our best friend, when we lose family members, when we lose members of the church, we feel the sting of death. Because we miss them and we desire to see them and we cannot see them anymore. But for them, for the one who went on to be in glory, their state is far better. Because they get to be with their Savior, with their Messiah, their Christ, Jesus. He says in verse 24, but to remain in the flesh is more necessary for your sake. This is why Paul was torn between the two. His heart burned for the people in Philippi. In fact, he, his heart burned for all of the churches that he planted throughout the Roman Empire. But for him to die and be with the Lord was far greater. And I think for... All of us, we should have that deep desire, not just to serve and live in this life, but to graduate from this life and enter into the greater glory, which is life eternal with God. 
He says this in verse 25, since I am persuaded of this, what is he persuaded of? I think it's the following part of this verse. Since I am persuaded of this, of this I know that I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy. Paul understood that his work was not yet finished. He might have been in prison at that very moment when he wrote that letter, but he was not done preaching the gospel. He was not done pastoring the people in Philippi. And so he was persuaded, he was convinced that he was going to continue living and remain with the Philippians, with the other churches, so that they would continue to progress. They would continue to mature in their walk. They would continue increasing in joy. This is the work of Paul when it comes to the fruitful work of the ministry. It wasn't just the harvesting of, of souls, but the ongoing progress and maturity of the churches. As an apostle and as a pastor, his desire was to see those churches flourish and grow for the kingdom, that they would continue faithfully abounding in the things of God. And Paul said, it's better for me to die and be in the presence of God. That's far better. But my work's not done. I know this. I'm persuaded of this. I'm convinced of this. I know I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. Verse 26, so that because of my coming to you again, that is, since he knew he was going to remain, he also knew that he was going to return to the people of Philippi and encourage the church there, build them up in the faith. He knew he was going to return to Philippi. So he says, because of my coming to you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus may abound. Verse 27. He says, just one thing. If you're going to heed this letter, just keep this in your mind. Just one thing. As citizens of heaven, and yes, our citizenship, who we identify as, when we walk about this earth, we carry with us the citizenship of heaven. We walk with our eternal hope in our hearts. We walk with the kingdom of God in our minds and in our spirits through the Holy Spirit. As citizens of heaven, live your life worthy of the gospel of Christ. Because being a citizen of heaven means that you will proclaim the good riches of the gospel of Christ by the way you live your life. All of us should live according to this reality. We are all citizens of heaven. We all walk with eternal hope in our hearts, and we all have the kingdom of God in our minds and the spirit with us. And so therefore, we can have absolute confidence that as we live for the kingdom of God, we will know that the we are walking worthy of the gospel of Christ. And so he says, then, whether I come and see you, that's returning back to them, or I'm absent, in other words, if I can't see you, so whether I can see you or can't see you, I will hear about you, that you are standing firm in one spirit. They're united. The major theme of this book is unity, oneness, family. 
the same mindset. I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit and one accord, contending, fighting, defending, advancing, contending together for the faith of the gospel. That's the purpose and the intention of unity, of oneness, is to further the gospel to the world. If we are not engaged in the work of the gospel to the world as a church, as the people of God, then we are not acting as citizens of heaven. That is our mandate. That's our call. That's our great commission. We are citizens of heaven, and therefore we should be united under the banner of the heavenly citizenship. He says in verse 28, not being frightened in any way by your opponents, and the opponents can range anything from the Roman Empire to the Imperial Guard to Judaizers, to false witnesses, to false prophets, to anyone who seeks to destroy the people of God and the church of God. It could even be demonic and spiritual. But don't be frightened. God is with us. So not being frightened in any way by your opponents, this is a sign of destruction for them. What is the sign of destruction? For these opponents, the sign of destruction is their opposition against the church. If someone comes against you, if someone comes and tries to oppose the work that you're doing for the gospel, that opposition that they're engaging in is a sign of the destruction of your opponents. They're lost in their sin and in their wickedness. So in their opposition, they are proving that they are on their path to everlasting and eternal hell. Eternal punishment, eternal torment in the fires of hell. But at the same time, if they do come against you, if these people oppose you, then this is a sign not only of their destruction, but of your salvation. So if you have people in your life that do oppose you for the gospel, that is a sign of your salvation, of the fact that you are living for the kingdom of God, that you are being a faithful citizen of heaven. And that you are contending for the faith of the gospel. He says, and this is from God. This is the work of God. This is the power of God. This is the spirit of God in your life. It's a tremendous reality. And to conclude, for it has been granted. It has been gifted. This is something that you receive as an act of God's sovereign grace. And what is this gift? What is this sovereign grace that is given to you? It has been granted to you on Christ's behalf. So this is from Christ to you. And it has been granted to you on Christ's behalf, not only to believe in him, so your faith you had to believe in him for your salvation, for your justification, That faith that you had to believe in him is gifted, it's granted to you 
on behalf of Christ. But not just belief, not just faith for your salvation, he says, but also to suffer for him. This is what it means that to live is Christ. Because Christ becomes all in all. On Christ's behalf, you live in faith. You live in obedience. You live in belief for your salvation, for your justification. And this has been granted to you by Christ. So to live is Christ and to die is gain because not only is your belief not only is your belief granted to you but also your suffering and even if that suffering leads to death that is gain these are gifts sovereign grace has been granted to you because of Christ, God, by the Spirit, awakened you and granted you the gift of faith so that you would believe on Christ, but not just believe, but also suffer for Christ. It's a tremendous call for the Christian to not just say, I believe, but to suffer for him, just as he suffered for us. He says in verse 30, since you are engaged in the same struggle that you saw I had, this is Paul, and now here that I have. That's prison. So the Philippians saw Paul struggle for the faith contend for the faith and paul said that was granted to me to not only believe but also to suffer for him for christ and the philippians saw this he saw they saw this struggle of paul and now he's saying you philippians are engaged in that same struggle that you saw that I had and still have to this day in my imprisonment. And yet Paul in his state of imprisonment is saying, my suffering has been granted to me. It's a gift. It's an act of sovereign grace. It is for my good because in my chains, in my imprisonment, I get to live for Christ. And if I die in my imprisonment, that is gain for me. Christian, to live is Christ and to die is gain because we know we have been gifted. We have been granted to not only believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him is a tremendous reality. May we never take it lightly and may we always keep in our minds that we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We are citizens of God's heavenly kingdom. Live for Christ and your death will only result in more glory more love, more joy, more peace. God bless. Until next time on Walking Through the Word. If you have been blessed by our Bible studies and would like to help support us, you can visit our website at www.sovereigntrinity.com and click on the Give tab. Or you can use one of these three avenues. We have Cash App, Venmo, and Zelle. Simply pull out your iPhone or your smartphone, pull up the camera, scan one of these QR codes, or look us up on Zelle through Sovereign Trinity Church at gmail.com. God bless.